John Churchill, the Duke of Marlborough, and Prince Eugen had achieved what is probably their greatest victory at the village of Blenheim in 1704. As mentioned previously, the French army was forced to halt campaigning in Germany and return to the Spanish-controlled Flanders in the north. Initially, Marlborough wished to invade through the region of Alsace and Lorraine. The plan involved an attack on multiple fronts. The Dutch under Lord Overkirk and Tilly would contain the French Marshal Fichua in Flanders, whilst Marlborough and von Baden would advance through Alsace, which was less fortified than northern France. Although Marlborough was talented in coming to agreements with officers and generals of all different nations and personalities, the conflicts between their interests was now just too great. The Dutch feared an invasion of their country without the support of the Imperial and British Army, especially if Dutch forces were sent to aid the campaign in Alsace. Von Botten feared that Marshal Marchand would march to meet Marlborough and join Villars. Other Allied commanders pointed out that Alsace also had strong forts such as Verdun and Metz further south. Marlborough would move and capture Trier from the French currently holding it, but Marshal Villars, believing the Allied army to be superior to his, stayed on the defensive around Luxembourg, covering Marson further south in Alsace. Villars wouldn't budge, and, but Marlborough finally received reinforcements he much needed from Denmark and Prussia. But before he could act with them in Alsace, terrible news came by. Marshal Virois headed east and attacked the city of Huy. The Dutch demanded that Marlborough reinforce against and forestall any French attacks in Flanders. It was decided that Flanders would be the main focus, and Marlborough was forced to abandon the Alsace campaign. Villars had outwitted him. For Marlborough, the new set of commanders he had to work with were troublesome, each wanting something different. His closest match, Eugen, was prioritizing the campaign in Italy to send much-needed aid to the Piedmontese. And thus, Marlborough left the main body of the army under his younger brother, John Churchill. The Duke himself would be forward with the cavalry. Meanwhile, thousands of Dutch troops under Lord Overkirk and Claude Zerkles de Tilly joined near the city of Zutlu. With the two armies now united, the relief of the sieges of Huy and Maastricht became priority. After a series of conferences in the Netherlands, the Allied plan would be to dismantle the lines of Brabant and defeat Villeroy, whilst the Imperials attacked in Italy. The Allies took Zutlu and defeated the Comte de Noël at the Battle of Elixheim. Villeroy stripped garrisons and other small field armies of troops to strengthen his own. He possessed a larger field army of Spanish, Walloon, French, and Bavarian troops, who had followed the Elector, Maximilian II, after Bavaria was conquered by the Imperials. Marlborough had a mostly foreign army to oppose him, with Danish, German, and especially Dutch troops who made up the bulk of the Allied army. Marlborough was as much of a coalition commander as modern NATO generals today. Shortly after the previous events, Villeroy drew his attention to the Allies, and both sides would converge on the small village of Ramillier. Villeroy wasn't much of a warrior compared to Villars, Vendôme, or Berwick. He was a great friend and admirer of Louis XIV. Without demonstrating any extraordinary feat, he was made marshal in 1693. Earlier in the war, he was defeated by Prince Eugen in Italy. Yet his positioning was reasonable at Ramillier. The many creeks and streams provided an obstacle for the Allies. And after that, the Bourbon forces held an uphill position at Autreglis and Ophus. The Duke of Birkenfeld, cousin of the Elector, held Autre Eglise. Villeroy led the army from Ophus. De Artenon and the Elector held Ramillier. De Giscard held forces near the Vichyl stream, supporting Ramillier. And on the Allied side, Overkirk faced Ramillier and Tavier. Marlborough and Churchill faced Ophus and Autre Eglise, with Tilly commanding the few Allied cavalry on the Allied far right. Both armies totaled near 60,000 men each. With the first action, Marlborough ordered Overkirk to clear the left flank, to clear Tavier and the Mahane Valley for his cavalry, which were deployed opposite of the Bourbon cavalry. The task was given to Vert Meller's brigade, also given two light guns. Vert Meller first served in Louis XIV's army, 
who was obliged to serve in the Dutch army as the war began. He captured Branchon, then Bonnef, advancing up the road until volleys from French dragoons rang out and hit a few of his men. The Dutch answered back with rippling volleys and light artillery fire. The firefight was quite one-sided. The Bourbons were outnumbered and had no artillery support. The dragoons were forced from the Franquine farm and withdrew to Tavier. Tavier was the key to the Bourbon right wing. It was defendable, but held by only 200 Swiss troops under La Motte's brigade. Lightly reinforced by the retreating dragoons, the rest of La Motte's men were at Remilier. The Dutch were lightly impeded by the walls of Tavier, but the Swiss troops did not hold for long, and fell back beyond the buildings. La Motte ordered a brigade of dragoons under Nothaft and Ferrari, and four infantry regiments under Nonant and Wolfskill to reinforce Tavier. The dragoons saddled forward, but only ran into the Dutch volleys. Lamont was forced to reposition his men on a higher ground, but in a daze of confusion. Vert Miller calmly advanced and formed his men into a line of battle, and fired more devastating volleys. Lamont had to give up destroying a strong bridge on the Vissel. Now, the only option was for Nonant and Lamont to take the enemy head on, but they were finally shattered by the intense fire. With the Swiss troops fleeing, so did the reinforcements that had witnessed them running towards their brigade. Many of the leading officers were killed or captured, so Lieutenant Colonel de la Colonie gathered a few hundred men to halt the advance in any way he could. But he was overwhelmed, and his mere battalions were forced to spectate for the rest of the battle. Ferd Miller had accomplished his task, and now the way was clear for Mabro to advance. On the Allied left, where the troops rested around the hamlet of Fool, after the long march. The Earl of Orkney gave the order from Mabra to advance his leading infantry to begin the assault. If successful, the infantry would disrupt the Bourbon line of retreat. The crossing of the Petit Guit would be much easier made by the pioneers sent forward hours earlier to ease the advance. Villeroy saw this and ordered his staff to their positions. He wanted to shatter the infantry with volleys and a finishing cavalry charge, believing that the main attack would occur while Marlborough would use his own countrymen. Bourbon skirmishers fired at the advancing infantry, but could not stop them, gradually giving ground to the slowly advancing Allied infantry. Birkenfeld's Franco-Spanish infantry poured ineffective volleys onto the Allies, who responded with their own, but as the Bourbons were in cover, their volleys were also ineffective. The fighting went back and forth, and the Allies were in position to attempt to outflank Birkenfeld. But as they tried, Marlborough gave the order for Orkney to withdraw his troops, and they did, pulling back enough to be out of range of musket fire. Casualties were fairly light on both sides. However, the Allies bought time for the Allied infantry and cavalry under Overkirk to arrive and deploy into formation to attack the Bourbon center. Overkirk now outnumbered Giscard's cavalry possessing over half of the entire Allied army's cavalrymen. Once Overkirk's cavalry finally formed for battle, they began to advance at a trot. Giscard's cavalry did the same, and soon the white and blue-coated cavalry of the Bourbon army charged with the elite Maison du Roi, or King's household, straight forward at the Allied cavalry. The charge became what is known as the largest cavalry engagement in early modern history. Marlborough divided cavalry to his right to aid Overkirk and hopefully turn the tide. Marlborough himself was even isolated and chased down by French cavalry. His horse was shot from under him and he made it safely unharmed to a friendly formation. History was mere seconds away from being altered. The Maison du Roi pushed back the first line of Allied cavalry, but were halted by Allied reinforcements and the battle raged on further. By now, the artillery bombardment from Marlborough had done much damage to the Bourbon defenses across their line. Now, Allied troops in the center had formed up for attack, first met by fire from the Bavarian troops stationed in Ramillier. The Allies responded with more disciplined and more well-timed volleys. Successfully rallying the Dutch squadrons, Marlborough was finally relieved to see the cavalry brigades from Dompre and Oyen begin to force the French and Spanish to give ground. Marlborough dismounted 
and lured some French horsemen into the Swiss lines, who bayoneted them. And a cannonball decapitated Marlborough's captain general as he mounted onto his saddle. The battle was in a state of complete chaos. The French cavalry by now were finally forced to withdraw up the hill. This opened up the flanks around Remolier for the Allied infantry to flank. Holding the village were the mostly Bavarian and Irish battalions under de Artena. Knowing how integral the village was to the Bourbon defense, he divided his men into two sectors to face the infantry and another to screen the Allied cavalry. Leading the defense against the Allied infantry was Charles O'Brien, Viscount of Clare. The Allied infantry advanced and outflanked the Bourbons in Ramillier. The French and Irish defenders poured massive volleys into the Allied advance, but it did not stop the Allies from coming closer and closer. As the Allies came within range, O'Brien charged at the enemy ranks with his Irishmen, eager to avenge previous defeats in Ireland. The Allied and Irish infantry clashed in a great melee. Many officers were killed, and both sides took heavy casualties. O'Brien's regiment was forced to recover, but so were the Allied regiments engaged. There is even a legend saying about how O'Brien's regiment had captured an Allied color. However, Marlborough had plugged the gap, and Orkney's infantry were ready to advance once more. He had bought time to reassess his position, and undoubtedly gain the tactical initiative he needed. Up until now, the Bourbon cavalry held their ground with initial success. This would change as over 4,000 Danish cavalry were added to the fray. The results of their charge were devastating. The Bourbon right flank held on by a single thread, and now it collapsed under the immense pressure. Some regiments fled towards the Vissel stream, and others followed Gikar to Savely. De La Colony's volleys from his battered troops discouraged further pursuit. Overkirk repositioned his cavalry to rest. The Allied infantry resumed their attack on the now dangerously exposed Ramillier. The Dutch Blue Guards and Argyll Scots resumed their attack. Initial volleys from the troops in Ramillier shook the advancing line, but the Allied infantry continued on. The Bourbons were forced back, but not without a fight. The Allies pushed into the village itself. Overkirk's cavalry had finally recovered, rode by, and surrounded the men in the village. With no escape, the Bourbon troops surrendered, 27 battalions in all. Villeroy saw the disaster unfolding before him, and in late fashion sent the elite French guard to attack. They slammed into the British regiments and forced them back across the Petit Guy, but they advanced nearly too far and were forced to pull back. It was clear to de Artena, Villeroy, and the Elector that they had to withdraw. The French and Swiss Guard regiments screened the Allied forces coming to Olfus, desperately in an attempt to cover the withdrawal and prevent it from turning into complete chaos. However, Overkirk's cavalry, along with some from the center, swooped north and battered the Bourbon infantry. At Outre Eglise, Orkney's infantry advanced onto the hill unopposed as the regiments there were preparing to withdraw. Lumley's cavalry charged the Bourbons out of frustration from inactivity, meeting with the regiment du Roi, the king's own, most of which were still gathering their kit and knapsacks discarded prior to the battle. A small pocket desperately held off the cavalry as much as they could, but most of the regiment fled with huge losses, losing around 800 men in the charge. What was left of the Bourbon army retreated as the rest were battered slowly by the Allied advance. Fortunately for them, the Allies were also tired enough to not launch an extensive pursuit. Out of 62,000 men, the Bourbons lost around 7,000 men killed and another 6,000 wounded or captured. The Allies lost around 3,000 to 4,000 men in total. A fairly costly victory, but for the Bourbons, it was their fourth great defeat in the last three years, and their third just this year in 1706. 
As we saw at Turin, Italy fell to the Habsburgs. The Bourbons failed to besiege Barcelona in Spain, and now Flanders would fall to the Allies, officially being given to Austria at the end of the war. The only success in 1706 for the Bourbons was Villars' actions in Alsace, keeping it safe from invasion. The year was known as the Year of Miracles for the Glorand Alliance. The defeat was so quick and shocking that the Spanish army in Flanders no longer existed, and neither did the Allied Cologne army. But now came a greater task for the Allies. The French possessed a massive fortress belt built by Marshal Vauban in the previous decades. It allowed the Bourbon army to be shielded to regroup for another battle, and forced the Allies to piece it apart, fort by fort, loss by loss, in order to invade mainland France. And for once, a breath of relief would come to the Bourbons. To be continued.